Welcome to today's presentation, Protecting Intellectual Property in a Collaborative Software Development Environment. My name is Ron Pacioli, and I'm going to be your moderator for the next 60 minutes or so. Before I introduce our speakers today, I'd like to cover a few house cleaning items. If you have a bad connection and are listening through your computer speakers or are unable to listen through your computer, you can always call into the 800 number listed on the slide above. Today's session will be recorded and made available to all participants, along with the slides from today. If you object to being part of a recorded session, you can disconnect at this time. The session will also put participants in a listen-only mode. At any time, if you would like to ask a question, please type your question in the question pod located on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to respond to your questions throughout the presentation, and at the end, as time permits, we'll open up for additional questions as well as review some of those questions that have come in. Lastly, in the upper right-hand side of your viewing area, you will see an icon with four arrows. This will allow you to expand the viewing area of the presentation. The same icon will bring you back to this view where you can see the question pod. So let's get started. How secure is your intellectual property? Today's collaborative and open software development environment can speed innovation, however, it can also open up a company to risk of IP theft and infringement. Conversely, if you batten down the hatches, you'll then recognize how your IP can grow in value and help you gain speed to revenue. In this webinar, experts for the Center for Responsible Enterprise and Trade, or CREATE.org, and Iron Mountain's Intellectual Property Management Team will discuss the steps your company should take to safeguard intellectual property, both within your company and with critical business partners. CREATE is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., chartered to help businesses and their supply chain partners implement practical and cost-effective IP protection, management, and anti-corruption programs. Iron Mountain's Intellectual Property Management Division is an industry-leading technology escrow provider with the mission of helping companies engaged in technology transactions, leverage IP, mitigate risk, and to protect their investments in their supply chain. Today's presenters. Leading the session today are Frank Bruno from Iron Mountain and Alan Dixon from CREATE. As you can see from his specialties listed on this slide, Frank works with attorneys and contracting professionals on intellectual property matters related to strategies and guidance for protecting investments in technology. This involves mediation during heavily contested negotiations on technology licensing and contingency planning. Allen has worked with companies, trades associations, and governments for more than 30 years on intellectual property legislation, litigation, and practical advice. He is a noted international specialist, having worked on three continents, and he serves currently as the Intellectual Property Council for CREATE.org and is based in London, England. So here's the agenda for today that we're going to be covering. We'll talk about the vulnerabilities and threats to intellectual property, the elements of an effective intellectual property protection program, and how third parties play an important role in protecting it. We will discuss maximizing the value of IP and the practical steps that you can implement now. Following the conclusion, we'll open up the lines for Q&A. So as you can see, there's a lot that we plan to cover in the next 60 minutes. So Without further ado, Frank Bruno from Iron Mountain. Frank? Thanks, Ron. Uh, so to kick things off, let's dispel the myths of IP and software development. First, not everyone is as honest as you. You might enter into a software development relationship with the best in of intentions and enthusiastic to work with the best code writers in the business, but remember, it's business, and if there's a way to generate money outside the relationship, they will. They'll do it by taking the work they created for you and leveraging it across multiple clients who you may end up competing with and who you may end up enjoined in litigation over patent infringement, copyright infringement, misappropriation of intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera. It, it may be cheaper to outsource the development work, but beware of the IP laws governing your relationship or those outsourcers who simply don't care about the laws. We'll cover this in greater detail as we discuss the vulnerabilities and threats. 
And just because you applied for a patent or have a patent doesn't mean that you were the first to invent. It's possible that someone else can produce evidence that proves otherwise. If you can't defend against that, you might lose everything that you worked so hard to produce, forcing you to go back to that day job working for somebody else. And it doesn't matter that you've been developing the same technology for years either. The patent trolls will find you, also known as non-practicing entities, NPEs, buy up large chunks of intellectual property for the sole purposes of seeking out competing business concerns so they can legally extort money from them or threaten their very business by virtue of the legal system, thus causing you to spend big money on your case. Conversely, if you partner with a developer who created virtually the same code for another client and that other client's competing with you on your soil, it may become necessary to file your own claim. The ensuing pain is going to be the same, but this time it's for the survival of your business. Now then, it, if you haven't taken the steps to secure your IP rights, it doesn't mean game over for you. It means you need to do something about it right now. Don't wait another day and consult with the right people to help you repiece artifacts with authentic dates validated through whatever means to salvage the time and to get it into the custody of a neutral third party who will date and timestamp receipt of your deposit materials to pad your war chest, so to speak. Trust us, it will become a war chest when you open up that letter from opposing counsel. And if no one has ever suggested the steps to protect your IP, it doesn't mean you don't have to do it. You just have been too focused on one piece of the business, developing the IP, and not really thinking about the risk mitigation related to protecting it and what's, you know, what's yours. Just because your legal counsel hasn't recommended it doesn't mean you need to, that you don't have to do it either. It just means you need better legal counsel. And finally, it's not just about you either. It's about the supply chain. Your suppliers should protect their IP too. They should be advised that their IP affects your IP, which affects your customer's IP, and so on down the line. All of the necessary precautions should be employed to ensure survival and to minimize the risk if something bad happened. Next, Alan's going to talk more about the vulnerabilities, threats, and impact of IP infringement, but stay tuned. We'll also cover the upside if you do the right steps to protect your IP. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, what we're going to be looking at on the, this part of the call really is the range of things that you, know, you, you certainly should be thinking about and doing if you're um, doing your own software development or if you out, outsource this activity, and, and particularly the kinds of things that um, you need to be doing where your intellectual property, your copyrights, your patents, your, your other rights, your trade secrets rights in your material is concerned. Um, I've been working um, over a number of years um, with small companies, with big companies, both inside and as their outside lawyer. And um, I've just seen the same kinds of things come up over and over again. The kinds of things Frank's have been talking about, which, which really relate to, um, you know, not paying attention to the IP rights you ought to own, not identifying them, not filing a patent, not protecting your source code, and things like that. And also not keeping good evidence that you were actually the one that had invented this thing. Sometimes IP rights are really only as good as the piece of paper, literally, that they're documented in. There's, there's other kinds of vulnerabilities, and you see on this slide, I've, I've put some of these up here that I see all the time. Um, I hope those of you that are on the call know this, but if someone else develops your software or other creative or innovative material that you might be putting in your software, you might not own it <laughs> if you don't have the contract in place that says that you own it. I have worked on more than one deal in the last couple of years where companies hoped to sell technology to others and found out at the last minute that actually their independent outsourcing partners had never signed over the IP rights to them in the material that you know my clients had paid for and that, and that they wanted to sell to somebody else. So keeping an eye on the paperwork is hugely important. 
Also keeping an eye on whether open source software is, is being put into things that you outsource. Now, this may be perfectly in line with your business model, but, but if you're hoping to charge for what you're doing or if you're um, wanting to license your material to someone else, you might find out that you have to give it away for free or you might have to give rights to what you've done to other people that you're using their material. Another thing I see all the time is companies outsourcing software or other functions, you know, development or manufacturing to a third party, but the supplier, the outsourcer, the outsourced company has absolutely no idea and no processes in place internally on, on protecting your stuff. So their, their employees may have no idea it's yours, they may have no idea what to do with it, <laughs> they may have no idea you're expecting it to be protected in a certain way. They may not even be under an NDA to protect your material from disclosure or use by others. Their IT systems may not be up to scratch. You may have the best you know, firewalls in the world, but your suppliers may not, and that's the weakest, the weakest link for your stuff leaking out. So really on the subject of, of suppliers providing goods and services that you're using to develop your software or otherwise in your business, the, the question really is, how would you survive? You know, what's going to happen to you if these people were to stop doing business, if the things they were providing to you turned out not to be yours? How important is IP, particularly in the outsourcing world, to your business? All these kinds of threats and vulnerabilities are very common when you're talking about outsourcing development or other supply of IP related things, particularly in the software industry, which we're talking about today. I won't go into too much detail about the impact. Frank's mentioned some of this, but if you're talking about patent and copyright, for example, um, you know you may end up with uh, components or things in your product that are found to be infringing for whatever reason, and you know suddenly you've got a loss of supply or the inability to to sell your own material that contains this infringing material. What does that mean? Money legal fees, lost sales, lost business, uh, something really to be avoided. Another thing a lot of companies are paying attention to at the moment are tr is trade secret theft. Now trade secrets are, are just confidential and proprietary information that has value because it's kept secret and it's a form of intellectual property. But you know we're talking about your proprietary algorithm for example your particular formula or product configuration, your manufacturing know-how, your confidential customer or, or financial information. Trade secret theft takes place in a number of ways, a lot of times through employees, a lot of times through third-party suppliers. And um, you lose this, and as anyone can tell you, if your secret sauce goes out the door, you can lose your competitive edge. There's an amazing example. I don't know if you've heard of the company AMSC, uh, a U.S. company. Wind Turbine Technology was their stronghold. And their Chinese customer that was actually building the wind turbines um, is alleged in a number of lawsuits going on at the moment uh, to have circumvented the technical protections on the software, put it into their own, uh, into their own wind turbines, and AMSC is claiming that it's lost 80% of its revenues, had to lay off 60% of its workforce, and, and uh, has lost more than $450 million. So trade secret theft can be a, a, a huge uh, damage as well. Not to mention, obviously, counterfeit components, other supply um, can cause problems for your customers and even consumers. You know, low quality um, defective goods, and even dangerous goods, depending on what kind of business you're in. You know, Alan, I, uh, I, I recently saw a news report that highlighted counterfeit products sold in some cut-rate dollar stores, and a sample of a hair product was tested and found to contain heavy metals, which were extremely harmful. So, you know, like the Latin phrase, uh, caveat emptor, um, let the buyer beware. Sometimes if a deal well, seems too good to be true, it probably is. Well, exactly. And, and one of the other things I know software developers particularly uh, face is if you have outsourced um, some material and your outsource um, 
you know, developer is using, you know, who knows what software tools off the internet or things that aren't secure, you know, they could be building hacks into the various stuff that you are going to be putting into your product. So even in the software area, you know, if we're talking about you know, airplane controls, for example, managed by software, this stuff can be very dangerous. <coughs> so what kinds of practical areas and protections should you be thinking about to make sure your intellectual property and proprietary information don't go out the window? Well, just an initial uh, observation on my side. Um, I'm a lawyer by uh, profession, and just to let you in on a little secret, if you're not a lawyer, um, we lawyers tend to focus on a few things very well. We focus on getting the IP rights registered, getting the contracts and the paperwork, you know, paperwork done up front, maybe a little bit of dil due diligence if you have a new supplier or licensee. We are good about helping to get licenses and revenue streams in place for the IP that we've registered. Um, but at that point, you know, we're often not involved in the process and typically, you know, frankly, if you come around the office, we're sitting back hoping nothing bad will happen. <laughs> So if it does, we know how to sue people, we know how to report them to the police, but, but typically the approach to IP and trade secret protection by lawyers in the past has been pretty much one shot and reactive. Very little was going on over time to see how things were going or to make improvements if things weren't going well, if problems were found or if the, or if the situation changed. So the, the uh, <coughs> approach that CREATE has uh, developed and we're talking about here is to build I IP, intellectual property and trade secret protection into your business management systems, into the ongoing rhythm of your business that already manages other things really well, like quality control, for example, or environmental standards, labor, labor compliance, other kinds of issues, over time in an integrated way. and. We think that IP, intellectual property, can also benefit from these kinds of management system treatment. The benefits are obvious. People in the company know what, know what they should be doing. Um, your communication with your suppliers are, is clear and informative. These issues get handled in a proactive way. And in most companies, you've already got some of these so-called management systems in place, you know, reviewing dealing with your suppliers, reviewing uh, issues that have come up that you use for compliance in other areas, so saying like QA or, or environmental, which fit really well and can be used also for, for overseeing your intellectual property protection. Frank's going to be talking about one particular uh, procedure that can really help protect your software and that source code escrow with developers that are working for you. But I'm going to try to give you a a bit of an overview of the whole range of types of protection practices that can help you make sure that the crown jewel is really your intellectual property, your proprietary information remain yours, um, not just today, but for the long run. So as I was saying, CREATE, the group I've been working with, the Center for Responsible Enterprise and Trade, has discussed these problems and reviewed protection practices with quite a number of multinational companies as well as small and medium-sized companies to see what kinds of problems they've had and what kinds of systems they've put in place to reduce the problem of intellectual property theft or misappropriation of trade secrets. We've put together a set of best practices for protecting IP and trade secrets. And really what we're talking about here is applying these kinds of ongoing protection and monitoring in all the areas of your company where intellectual property comes up. Intellectual property isn't just the exclusive domain of the legal department. Intellectual property comes up with your uh, supply chain people, with your compliance people, with your finance people, with your marketing people. And, and it's really important that all of the areas of your company where IP is touched, let's say, where IP is dealt with in some way or another, um, have these kind of systems in place to protect it in the way you're expecting it should be protected. So just to summarize the eight categories we've got here, 
Intellectual property needs to be addressed in your company policies, the detailed procedures that implement those policies, as well as in the contracts, inventories, and other kind of uh, relevant record keeping that you do. Um, second, it's important that it's managed by people with responsibility to manage intellectual property, including people from all the relevant functions in your company that actually touch on the intellectual property. That's that senior management support, of course. If nobody's managing the protection of your IP company-wide, it's not being protected. <laughs> Proper risk assessment and risk management uh, based on actually understanding what IP you have and what the most likely and the most costly problems you're going to have um, are needed to help focus your attention and your resources on, on how, what kind of steps, how you should be protecting your IP. Next, managing IP well with your supply chain is also key. I can't tell you how many companies I've spoken to, and I speak to suppliers as well as people you know, in purchasing and other supply chain functions, but suppliers, employees, often have no idea what proprietary information they're handling and what they're supposed to be doing with it. Next, security and confidentiality management, that's physical security, IT security, that's also key. But again, just having a firewall is not going to do the trick. The systems that you've got need to be designed with an awareness of what intellectual property it is and what trade secrets it is that you're trying to protect. <laughs> where, where are the company blueprints on your IT system? You know, who has access to them? Are they encrypted? Is there a um, you know, need to know basis that people access it or can everybody get control of it. So a properly specced and properly designed physical and IT security system that actually takes account of your IP. Training, employee and supplier training also is super important. Ongoing monitoring measurement, that can really help keep tabs on things or how things are going and rapid ongoing response to problems, not just you know, whack-a-mole, but also getting to root causes of problems and fixing those as you go along. All super important for making your protection more than just what I think we've typically done in the past, just acting ad hoc and reactive. So, uh, so Alan, to, to clarify, the set of best practices that you're talking about here for protecting intellectual property and trade secrets, this was developed by CREATE, correct? Is this your intellectual property? <laughs> well, yes, but um, it is available in the marketplace, place, Frank, if, if the listeners want to go on create.org. A lot of this material is available uh, you know, for download and reading for free, and then we'll talk a bit later about, you know, we have several programs uh, that are scalable if people want to you know, look into this further. I would encourage you to, to think about kind of protecting IP in this sort of virtual uh, virtuous circle way of best practices, not just uh, a one-shot deal, but in an integrated way among all the areas of your company and your suppliers where IP is affected and on a regular basis that actually improves protection. So we start up here on the upper right with risk assessment. I'm looking at IP specific risks, knowing what kind of risk you're likely to face out in the market. A lot of companies don't even think about this. And particularly as you work with your suppliers and business partners, risk assessment and pre-contract due diligence, for example, are really important as you're trying to anticipate problems and put protections in place, hopefully before bad things happen. Contracts are super important. I don't think I need to emphasize that too much. They give teeth to your expectations of what people should be doing with your IP and to ensure that you know, supplier policies, procedures, security, employee training, all these ongoing things are actually done. And then next, not just putting the contracts in the drawer and hoping nothing bad happens, but, but just as you have an ongoing program to review other aspects of your business to do ongoing monitoring and management of your intellectual property protections. This is a good way to help maximize the value of your IP and proprietary information and uh, reduce the risk of problems that could, that could really hurt your business. So just to finish my bit here, to 
summarize what I would say are my top tips for improvement of protecting your intellectual property, particularly for you all that are involved in the software business and, and software development. I would, I would say they were these. One, know what it is you own. <laughs> Identify, secure, as Frank was saying, and inventory your IP, including uh, the kinds of practical steps Frank's going to be talking about in a minute, but also what, what trade secrets do you own? What is your most valuable trade secret list? And making sure you know what that is, what the risks are if it's, a, if it's taken, and you know, where it is on your IT system, who's handling it, and just inventorying your IP to know what it is you're, you're actually supposed to be protecting. Next, address IP protection in all your relevant contracts. I don't think I need to belabor this, but there's a lot of them. Employees, contractors, outsourcing and other suppliers, licenses, even second tier contracts. I'm concerned, you know, if my clients have a, an outsource partner, do they have consultants? Do they have outsource partners? Are those contracts protecting my clients' uh, confidential information, their software, their, their trade secrets? Third, develop IP protection policies and, and procedures. And Frank, just to, to get back to your question, if, if you go on the create.org website, we've developed model IP protection policies that, that you can sort of uh, pick and choose from, depending on the kind of company you're running. Um, you know, there's a very good set of policies there that, that you can use and implement uh, as, as your company policy. How, this is how we do things at my company. Obviously, get senior management and cross-departmental commitment. Again, every area where IP uh, comes up in your company needs to be on board with this. Uh, and, and integrating, obviously, that into every aspect of your business operation that's relevant. It's not just IT. It's not just legal that deals with intellectual property in, in a software company. Um, risk assessments, another a big thing on my list, using due diligence, obviously, if you're um, appointing new developers, but also just ongoing risk assessment. You know, where, where are the leaks likely to come from? <laughs> what are we doing to plug the leaks before our information goes out the door? And then finally, I would say um, building awareness um, among your staff, among your supply chain, among contractors, of the importance of protecting your intellectual property. Again, if people don't know what they're meant to be doing, they just won't do it. And finally, take corrective action where needed. But again, not just as whack-a-mole, but being proactive and thinking about, you know, we've had this problem, we've contained the problem, but now how can we prevent this from happening again? And how can we improve our systems uh, to make sure this doesn't happen again, if at all possible? Hey, so Alan, in terms of specific services that Create provides, do you, do you guys include the know-how and the how-tos when it comes to executing these stuff, these uh, these tips? You actually have a fully developed system that includes this stuff, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, again, we can talk a bit more about this later, but. Um, we have a range of things, including sort of a self-assessment where one could take an online survey and, and be benchmarked on you know, various aspects of these eight categories we're talking about. We've also got some very useful tools for the people that use the Create Service, including, a, I, I think, it's up to about 250 pages um, um, improvement manual with very specific ideas about you know, things you can be doing in each of these areas, model policies, checklists of things, um, very practical um, information, and also benchmarking, you know, what your suppliers are doing, for example, and, and um, following and encouraging them to improve over time. Wow, 250 pages. I hope you got hyperlinks. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> So, okay, uh, the upside to a good IP protection plan is that it, number one, um, addresses the risks from the previous slides that we talked about, the dishonest people, patent trolls, inadequate protection, uh, things of that nature. Uh, number two, IP is your corporate crown jewels. To protect them, 
is akin to maximizing value. Obviously, you, shouldn't you, you should always entrust a neutral third party who is not the U.S. Postal Service. You can't mail a package to yourself containing a copy of your IP for purposes of date and time stamping the envelope because while the envelope may not be opened, it remains in your custody and it's not tamper-proof. Additionally, it demonstrates how little was spent to protect your corporate crown jewels and the message it sends to prospective buyers. On the flip side, if you entrust your IP to a professional services company that specializes in such work, it demonstrates how much care went into the creation and the protection of that IP, thereby maximizing the value. Now then, in number three, we've mentioned this already and we'll say it again, IP deposits are fully discoverable. There's no good proof sitting in your offices or on your servers because these artifacts are just not tamper-proof. However, if you have artifacts entrusted to a neutral third party, and that third party will attest to when those deposits were made, and it's tractable during that time, the only logical conclusion would be that the deposit materials predated that point in time, which is irrefutable proof if ever needed to support an infringement claim or defend against one. Also, if you haven't done this in the past, Leveraging IP strategies like defensive publications can deter competitors from seeking patents to excel in your market. They can be used to box out the threats that you didn't even know existed. Five, putting employees, contractors, and suppliers on notice by inking non-disclosure agreements or employment contracts is simply not enough. You have to prove to them that you, you can prove ownership by making them aware of your IP, making, making them aware of your IP deposits with that neutral third party. It's like showing them a very big stick that you can hit them with if they act with willful misconduct and to, you know, discourage those activities. Believe me, there's no greater deterrent than the proverbial big stick. Six, audited deposit materials were served to support higher IP valuations, which is the goal, right? I mean, the difference is that when you submit to such a rigorous exercise, the effort can be worn as a patch on your sleeve that says certified trust. You can make the report results available to anyone who cares or needs to see it, whether it's a venture capital company, a lender, or a licensee to your technology. Nothing oozes trust more than the word of a neutral third party. And if you're seeking to raise capital or gain speed to revenue, then it's a no-brainer. Next, IP valuations are rigorous exercises in and of themselves. So the more work that you have put in yourself or you know, data that you can supply, the less expensive the process becomes and the more value that's derived from that exercise. If you truly want to maximize the value of your IP, You'll have a passion for the business and this information, this data should be easily accessible and easily verifiable. Finally, taking steps, steps to document, to audit, and to protect your IP is a means to increase its value. Never take your eye off your IP and never let it gather dust. Escrow? Are you kidding me? Yes. Believe it or not, one of the most practical ways to protect your intellectual property is to place it in escrow with a neutral third party who will date and timestamp the deposits. It's not a very well-known benefit, but technology escrow is the practice of securing intellectual property, albeit for the benefit of not just the owner, but a potential business partner or a customer. We'll talk more about the forces that drive the requirement for escrow in a minute, but for now, Let's focus on the old school versus new school thinking. So old school thinkers perceived escrow as a necessary evil to get their deal done when it became an 11th hour obstacle to closing the business. Paranoid owners wouldn't even let their mothers touch their IP, no less an escrow agent with little knowledge of the value or importance of the IP to the owner. So, a high percentage of deposit accounts were left empty or contained incomplete deposit materials. They thought customers would forget about it 15 minutes after the ink dried, so why bother keeping up with the deposits? Just avoid verification testing and they're in the clear. 
As a result, there is a perception that escrow simply doesn't work. And if the customer is dealing with an old school thinker, that's probably true. But what else is true is that the customer will eventually figure this out, that they're dealing with an old school thinker, uh, old school thinker and stop trusting them too. So new school thinkers use escrow to facilitate the business. They use it as a means to instill trust necessary to close more deals faster. Since they anticipate the requirement, they're proactive. And why not? Deposits containing their IP are fully tractable and discoverable. They get the native purpose of entrusting a neutral third party to protect their IP. This is the protection they need in case they get sued for IP infringement or they need to sue someone else. They get that if, they, if, if anything happened, prompting a release that their customers are also protected. After all, that's the primary reason for entering into an escrow arrangement, and it could represent an opportunity following a release. The beauty is that they can negotiate fees to cover the cost of escrow, sell it as a value-added service, and even negotiate royalties or maintenance contracts outside of the current business status if they were to stop doing business. Verification testing is a means to certify that trust. It helps them garner marketing value by sharing successful verification tests uh, in those reports with prospects that are in the same boat as customers before them. This demonstration of trust helps the seller to overcome the risk objections to doing business. And for the old school thinkers, keep in mind that they also buy goods and services that go into their product deliverables. If they're not leveraging escrow properly, there's a good chance that they're not protected either. So now then, let's take a look at the supply chain and the buyer-seller dilemma that escrow addresses. If you're working with software contracts, you'll no doubt be familiar with this concept. Historically, the driving forces behind setting up a license agreement varied greatly between the seller and the buyer. The seller's ideal contract would ensure maximum profits, high level of product control, as well as to maintain complete protection for the technology they're licensing, which happens to be their lifeblood of their, their business. The buyer, on the other hand, has its own priorities. They want to make sure that the seller supports the product for a reasonable amount of time and with a high level of responsiveness, as well as secure access to the technology if necessary, so they can maintain it themselves independently of the seller. This dilemma naturally causes some distrust between the parties, usually straining the relationship and stretching out the negotiation process. So the escrow arrangement provides for a reasonable compromise that allows each party to reap maximum benefits from the underlying business agreement, whether it's a supply agreement, license agreement, subscription agreement, or maintenance agreement. Buyers have business pressures. They need to react you know, for their internal client in order to satisfy their objectives. But they have prerequisites before signing a deal like the short list of things you see on the right-hand side of this chart. On the left-hand side of the chart, sellers have their own objectives, and with increased competition, they've moved from reacting to requests for escrow to proactively offering escrow to their clients to gain customer confidence and to level the playing field against larger competitors. They also realize that while they're on the sell side of the transaction, they're they're also very much a buyer in equally as many scenarios, hence the need to, to protect the supply chain for the benefit of downstream customers. There's a lot at stake because sellers buy stuff and buyers are sellers too, and hopefully that makes sense to everyone here. And that's where arrangement is, a, is set up to address the what ifs in business. If, you're, if, if something were to happen to an upstream supplier with implications to your downstream client, that would represent a threat to your business and something to consider when you're negotiating on the buy side. As a seller, taking preemptive approach to facilitate the business instills trust and generally satisfies your prospect's expectation, while at the same time, protecting your IP. So to conclude,
Intellectual property management is a business function that allows companies to protect its value, its brand, its business model, and its revenue streams. Intellectual property management also helps to avoid risks associated with in infringement claims, which can lead to litigation, stiff financial penalties, loss of intellectual property, and potentially the discontinuance of business in the current course. Companies may have decentralized informal practices in place to manage IP, but sometimes have not been shared nor have created formal standards, policies, or procedures across the enterprise. Further, when outsourcing and entrusting third parties to create intellectual property for the company, they have no consistent practice to prove ownership or to protect these assets. The best practice is the creation of a standardized, compliant, and consistent IP management program designed with the centralized policies and procedures to store and account for IP. Whether engaged in a development agreement, license agreement, subscription agreement, or IP sale, the collateral that's core to the relationship is IP. Demonstrating consistent, tractable custody of the developed works can be the difference between leveraging IP versus litigating over IP. Like any good corporate initiative, executive level endorsement is key to make this initiative realistic and successful. Otherwise, competing priorities will thwart the effort as we've seen in the past. As an IP owner, you're in a unique position to gain the attention of these stakeholders who might have an interest in improving the market value of their IP. And trending are corporate sponsored programs and systems to improve IP management delivered by organizations like CREATE. As the cornerstone of our business, Iron Mountain is in a unique position to guide its clients toward CREATE as a way to deliver value when you least expect it, which is when you need to satisfy the escrow requirement. Iron Mountain is more than just an escrow agent. We, we understand that the value of your IP is immeasurable when it comes to your business. We like to think that there's a tremendous amount of value that can be derived from your engagement with Iron Mountain for escrow, and that involves CREATE. This relationship between CREATE uh, and Iron Mountain um, adds an element of credibility that you can leverage by association. Together, we deliver practical and cost-effective guidance that will undoubtedly improve your credibility in your respective marketplace. To drive this message forward, we'd like to offer some additional reference materials to you, our client, to consider as you endeavor to protect your corporate crown jewels. Well, from Create side, um, we're offering a range of resources for you, um, and particularly for those of you that are participating in the uh, webinar. Um, on our website, as I was saying, we have quite a number of interesting things, I think, particularly for software developers. Um, there's a white paper that I particularly recommend called Protecting IP Through Enterprise Risk Management. Um, that uh, talks about you know, having an inventory of the kind of uh, IP that you consider valuable, how you're managing it, looking at the possible risks and how you protect them in a more proactive way. There's also things like a trend alert on the website about how to build on IT security so it actually does effective IP protection. So you might have a look at create.org. And also, for those of you on the webinar, we're offering a, a sort of a taster, a free benchmarking of this, what I was mentioning before for companies. And, and this will involve you doing our self-assessment. So you know, one, one person at your company can go through our online self-assessment, um, which will benchmark particular areas of your company, of your company's IP protection and these areas we're talking about. Um, it takes about 60 to 90 minutes. Um, that covers all of the eight categories we discussed. And you'll be um, guided through that by one of the uh, CREATE experts who's been working with the program who's been working with me. So I think that's a very interesting uh, way to get some good insights, actually, into your own IP protection program. And you know, we can also talk to you about how you can extend that or how you could do it with some of your third parties, which we have a number of companies that 
that have done already. Frank? And in addition to taking that very first step with CREATE, you'll also receive a copy of our white paper on protecting the value of your IP. Along with it, you'll receive a copy of this presentation in PDF, uh, which will be emailed to the address that you provided when you registered uh, a little bit later today. Um, you can also visit our website to request a copy of our Timeless Software Escrow for Dummies book. And uh, sample agreements, sample escrow agreements are available upon request. There are a few varieties depending on what side of the transaction you're on. And it's often helpful to discuss the requirement with one of our escrow advisors before selecting the appropriate agreement and related services. Ron, at this point, I think we're ready for questions. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, great, great informative session. Uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, uh, you can go to the Q&A pod located on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, uh, and we'll be happy to field those now. Uh, a couple have come in as the presentation was going on. So the first question I have is for you, Alan. Uh, the question is, I was wondering what kind of effort is involved with implementing uh, such an IP protection program through CREATE, and then how approximately how long does it take for it, for it to uh, be completed from start to finish? Right. Well, thank you. Um, so it really depends on the size of your company, um, you know, the, 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 the extent of your business activities, the variety of your software development if you're in the software business. So, you know, we've worked with some major multinationals whose names you would know who, you know, this, this type of question uh, affects a lot of different departments and, you know, can be, can be time consuming and multinational. You know, you have to talk to people in finance, you have to talk to people in HR. I mean, it, it can be for a big company, you know, it, it's not like any other compliance issue. It, it's not necessarily a small issue. For smaller companies, obviously, if, you know, if you're a one-man band or <laughs> if you have a you know, fairly small company, obviously everybody that's working on your products and systems are right there in the same office and you know, it can be a much more streamlined process. So hard to generalize, I would say, um, but, but the question is really based on the, um, on the size of the company. I would say, you know, and it, it depends what you want to do with CREATE. So doing the benchmarking, so doing the online survey in these eight areas takes about an hour, maybe an hour and a half um, to, to go through. And we ask uh, questions about, you know, all the areas, about policies, about procedures, about contracts, about supply chain, all the things I was talking about. That's about a 90-minute process. Um, the options beyond that are to have an independent evaluation where you have a, uh, an expert um, talk with you for about an hour or so about the answers that were given and, and does an independent assessment on, on the benchmarking. So I do a number of these myself, actually. So I've talked to companies really all over the world and reviewed their um, independent evaluations with them. So we have other experts that do this as well. That's again about uh, an hour, an hour and a half process. On the back of the independent evaluations, um, we provide a um, improvement plan, so a summary report, a benchmark showing how you're doing compared to other companies and, a, and an improvement guide with specific information about things that we think you benefit from implementing sooner rather than later. There's the, there's the actual 250-page guide where you can use that as a reference uh, to, you know, maybe you know, develop new policies, develop some new procedures and things like that. And then there are follow-up calls then from there. Um, we, we typically do at least a couple of follow-up calls with you over time to talk about, you know, progress and things you want to deal with. So again, it, it depends on you know, kind of which, <laughs> which version of the uh, program you are involved in. This can also extend to your suppliers. So for the multinationals, for example, you know, I've worked on some where multinationals have appointed 20 or 
and 40 uh, of their suppliers that they want us to um, do the benchmarking with, have a look at some of them for independent evaluation, and report back to the company, obviously, with everyone's consent. You know, here's where your suppliers are. Here's the areas where we think improvement would be gained. So, um, again, how long is a piece of string? But you know, there are, are very short, manageable things you can do. And then, if you want involvement over time, um, you know, there's more in-depth uh, work that can be done. Obviously. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, Frank. We have a question here for you. Uh, who typically pays for escrow? Is it the buyer or the seller? Uh, that's a great question, Stephen, uh, uh, Ron, and, and I, I can tell you that uh, generally uh, the sellers uh, are, that are proactive about escrow uh, who are you know, in a position to resell it as a value-added uh, service option will, uh, will often pick up the cost. Uh, and then add their administrative fees and, 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 and charge that back to their customer. A best practice, however, is for buyers to uh, pay for the escrow for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, they're probably saving a little bit of money versus letting their, um, uh, their uh, supplier do it and then you know, hitting them with an upcharge. Uh, and then um, the other piece is uh, always making sure that the escrow is funded so that it doesn't terminate for non-payment. Okay, Alan and Frank, this, I guess, question is to both of you. Um, do you support international language support, specifically uh, Spanish? Um, from my side, from Create side, yes. Um, we've actually been working with some Mexican companies and, um, you know, looking at their systems and obviously have Spanish-speaking experts uh, that we've dealt with there. Uh, we've also been very active in Brazil. We have Portuguese speakers, Chinese speakers. We've had quite a number of companies from China, both as um, you know, the customer and as suppliers come through. So, you know, yes, from our side. And from the Iron Mountain side, um, one of our uh, senior managers um, uh, was raised in, in Puerto Rico, and, and he naturally speaks Spanish. So, yeah, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Frank, this question is also for you. Does Iron Mountain offer any IPM programs that complement what CREATE is offering? And if so, what are the general costs for these services? Well, uh, you know, throughout the years we've, uh, we've seen a lot and uh, we've been able to compile a significant amount of content that was designed to help uh, our clients uh, do a better job of managing their intellectual property, uh, especially if you know they, they they are faced with the escrow requirement from time to time. So having a repeatable process is very important, and um, we actually have a one-page repeatable process document that addresses the escrow requirement from the buyer's perspective as well as the seller's perspective. And uh, embedded within that word document are the the other um, uh, escrow uh, agreements that may have been memorialized in the past that can be leveraged for future use. So I think that's very, very important. Uh, as it complements creates, you know, that, that's generally something that we would address on a on a case by case basis. So if there was an opportunity to uh, to participate in in that uh, exercise, we would uh, certainly provide you know, whatever expertise we can, put pen to paper. And generally, you know, the costs for that uh, don't exceed the, the costs for the escrow services, the escrow and verification services that we provide, which is, you know, I would say in comparison to uh, investments in technology, uh, probably less than 1%. So a couple thousand dollars, you know, as opposed to the hundreds of thousands or millions that are spent on intellectual property. I see that we're at the top of the hour, so we have time for one last question. Um, and so, Alan, this will be for you. Can you provide some examples of how companies have worked with CREATE, uh, specifically what were their key issues, and how did CREATE help them? Well, it's interesting. One of the one of the um, multinationals um, whose suppliers I particularly have worked with 
Um, I talked to some of their suppliers in India as well as the United States, which was a real eye-opener for me, I have to say, and walked through some of their things like IT security, you know, how do they deal with employees who are handling the customer's IP and things like that. And um, I have to say, you know, first of all, everyone that I've spoken to about this program has really found it an eye-opener and really helpful to be able to walk through these issues in a systematic way and say, you know what, we don't actually do that with employees. <laughs> or, you know, one of the Indian suppliers that I spoke with had the most, I would say, IP-friendly, IP-specific um, protections in its IT system, for example. You know, log-on requirements, need to know, encryption, all kinds of things. And if you didn't do the IP training at the end of the year, you got banned from the system altogether until you did it. So quite an interesting spectrum. And I also think the companies that have put their own, you know, not just their own protections through the, through the service, but, but also put some of their suppliers through, um, have found it a really useful tool to be able to, uh, you know, take stock of where they are, make improvements to their systems that then they can apply to their, you know, the, their whole range of suppliers and business going forward. So I, I really enjoy uh, when I get the chance to talk to these, some, some of these suppliers particularly. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we're entering a phase where, as Frank was saying, you know, ongoing management really is becoming the watchword for IP. Okay, we are over our time, so we will end the session. Uh, we thank everyone for participating today. As Ben has mentioned, uh, you will receive a copy of this presentation and the recording later today. If there are any questions, both Frank and Alan's information uh, is made available here on this screen. And with that, we will end the session and thank everyone for attending today. Thanks very much.